Hello and welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. I'm coming to you from my home on the territories of the Lekwungen speaking people in Esquimalt, British Columbia. In this series, we're talking with staff of the museum who've been asked to work from home about their research and their work. June 7th to 14th is Oceans Week in Victoria. Originally a one day event on World Oceans Day, this year we're having a week long series of presentations and activities provided by partners around the city to support ocean inspired events on Southern Vancouver Island. Our current situation means that many of these programs are being live streamed. This week, all of our at home series uh, are Ocean Week themed and we're having a special uh, program on Saturday with Parks Canada as our guest. Today, we have Curator of Vertebrate Zoology, Dr. Gavin Hankey. Gavin has a particular interest in fish and today we're gonna to talk about fish you might see swimming just below the surface, near the dock, or perhaps just offshore. Welcome, Gavin. Thanks for having me. It's good fun to be back. Yes, you were with us yesterday, getting your feet wet. Yeah, oh yeah, that was good fun. Um, <laughs> so they, uh, that was, that's on our Facebook feed, is it? Yeah, it's posted on Facebook. And uh, you can also go to YouTube and watch it there, the Royal BC Museum YouTube channel. Yeah, so that was Liz, myself, Heidi Gartner, and Chris O'Connor as a team effort. That was that was absolute blast. Yes, it can be quite a production. Thanks for doing it. So, Gavin, when did you first start fish spotting? Oh, three, oh, I was probably three years old. You know, my, my uncles had ponds in England and I used to lie there with my face hanging over the edge watching for fish, uh, plankton, and they were thrilled with me because I was not afraid to pick up the leeches. So they were always scared that leeches would get into their pond, but I grabbed them and they were, I was the golden child for cleaning out their pond. So you've got some uh, early reinforcement to be interested in ponds and fish. Yeah, my, my first goldfish, I think I was, just after we moved to Canada, uh, or to Winnipeg in probably 74. So yeah, I've had fish ever since. Great. And you, um, you focused in um, paleo ichthyology, do I have that mm -hmm. right? So you were looking at fossilized fishes in your yeah. um, graduate studies. Yeah, I did a, I've described about 13 species of fish, uh, things that are brand new to science, no one had ever seen them before. And they're just on the cusp of, sort of merging almost two groups of things that are on their way to being sharks and things that are on their way to being a group called acanthodians which are extinct. Wow so another time maybe we can talk about fossilized fish but today um, you're going to share some fish ID techniques. So these are are we going to see fish that are mostly common to people here watching maybe along the coast? Who live along yeah this the is all about western coast the, of Canada. The, yeah some of these are fish that we saw yesterday in the video um, and these are photos I've taken in, in um, photo tanks, small tanks, so the fish can't get away. Um, and it's just a, a, some of the more common fish, and I've thrown in a couple of pictures of some of the rare ones that, to be honest, I've only caught once or twice, and they're gorgeous. So they're, it's, I think people will be surprised when they see that a fish like that, like these two guys specifically that I'll, I'll highlight, are, are on our coast. They look something like you'd see in the tropics. Great. Okay, well, you're going to share your screen so we can see these yep. fish and uh, we'll start working on our fish ID techniques. Okay. And, and there that twice. Oh, was that, did I get it wrong? <laughs> no, you're almost there. We're almost at full screen. Okay, hang on. So is that working? Yay. Yay. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, most of the fish you'll see in the intertidal zone are just like this little sculpin. They're, uh, they're kind of camouflaged because any time you walk along our coast, you'll see a heron skulking in the shadows looking for any small little morsel in the tide pool. So it's, uh, it's a good idea if you're an intertidal fish to, to hide either under rocks or look like a rock yourself. So um, this is a, a probably the most abundant fish in the intertidal. It's a, a tide pool sculpin, very appropriately named. Um, and they, they range in color through browns and grays, but it's probably the first fish you'll see when you walk down to our coast. Now, um, I'm gonna show you a couple of different environments uh, in this talk. And most people go, when they go in the intertidal, they think about rock pools, tide pools. 
And so, yeah, you've got coastline here that's exposed to heavy surf and it's, it's pounded daily, even more so when there's storms. But these, in, these environments are absolutely full of life and animals in this environment will have a way to cling to the rocks. And we all know about kelp with the holdfast that locks down to the, to the rock so it doesn't get washed away. Well, fishes also have really cool strategies to do the same thing. They stick themselves to the rock. Um, there are also more semi-protected areas. This is out on the west side of the island. So you get these bays that are, are protected from the main force of the waves, and you can see all the kelp in the bottom of this, in this, in this uh, embayment. But the tide pools here are absolutely fascinating. If, if you get away from the city, uh, the diversity of fishes goes way up. And that's saying something, because we did really well yesterday right here in town at Clover Point. Now, keep in mind that things that are in the intertidal have to go through daily changes. So in the summer, there's sunshine, so it gets warm. And the, 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 the intertidal, once the tide washes out, you've got things heating up, the ground will heat up, it will dry out. In the winter, the intertidal could get snow on it. It could get rain, so you've gone from salt water to total fresh water. There could be waves in a storm, and of course things are exposed to the air, so this is probably one of the most variable environments in the world for organisms to, to tolerate or, or adapt to. Whoop. I'm gonna have to there, get that out of there. So I'll just show you some faces for a little bit of some of the more common things you'll see. I did forget in this talk to include the buffalo sculpin because that's another sculpin that's common around our coastline here. They're called buffalo sculpins for the obvious reason. They've got very large spines on the edge of their gills. And when you grab them, they sort of put those spines out. So um, when, you're, when you're catching sculpins, always be aware that on their gills, there's, there's uh, variable types of spines that in some cases can actually draw blood. So you do have to be careful. Mm. Now the tide pool sculpin, is the most common, as I said. It's small, maybe the length of your thumb. They're not huge fish, but they're super abundant. And in, e even in a, a tide pool about the, maybe a meter by a meter, you could have a hundred of them. They're, they're amazing little fish. Uh, the, and, but also we get padded sculpins and smooth head sculpins. They're further down in the intertidal. The tide pool sculpin can be found way up high in the intertidal, whereas and that's, that's fine, you only get one or two species that are that tolerant of uh, environmental changes. But if you go further down towards the low tide line, that's when you start getting things like the padded sculpin and the smooth head sculpin. Now, they don't all often look like this. Color varies a lot. I've had smooth head sculpins that are pink, not sort of yellowy green like this one is. So, but it, you know, basically what we do is we look for these little tassels on the head and there's it's hard to see in this photo but there's a band of tiny scales just under the dorsal fin and on one species sometimes it's hard to tell these guys apart because there are so many sculpins here on one species these scales don't go past the back of the dorsal fin on another one they may wrap around the dorsal fin so, so it, i hate to say it but in some cases you really do need a microscope or a really good magnifying glass to identify the fish you have in hand so in general, in general, you found a sculpin if it's got those um, little frills just at the back of their head. Is that well, right? They, they, may, they may have frills down their body along the lateral line. Mm. Um, yeah, they're, they're highly variable. Um, there's a, a book out on fishes of the Salish Sea, and that's just our region here in Victoria. And the diversity of sculpins here is amazing. But if you go up the coast, out to the west side of the island, uh, diversity goes way up and so it's it really is a good idea to have a solid field guide when you're out collecting sculpins even the little tide pool sculpin has tiny little tassels on its head and along the lateral line yeah they're really quite cool sculpins usually have a big mouth like this one here that's a large mouth um, they are serious predators and they will they will gulp down quite sizable items now as we were talking about yesterday uh, one of the questions came in while we were doing our video um, what eels are in British Columbia and in the intertidal there aren't any eels. So eels in BC are open ocean, deep water, offshore. They don't come into the shallows. What most people see in the intertidal 
that they call an eel is a prickleback. And yes, they're eel-like in shape, but they're not eels. And they're called pricklebacks because the first part of the dorsal fin, each of those rays is actually a spine. And if you, if you get one in your hand, you can actually feel the actual, the spiny fin rays. And the first few rays of the anal fin are also spiny. And so this is a high coxcomb. And like the tide pool sculpin, this fish is found way high in the intertidal. So yesterday we were finding these guys on land. So wherever there's a rock that provides shelter from the sun, the rain, and just gives them a, a bit of a damp microclimate while the tide's out, you will find these high coxcombs. They're super abundant. You can lift one rock and see 20 of them. So they, they rival the tide pool sculpin as our most abundant intertidal fish. And of course, they're, they've got tiny scales. They're very slippery. They're really tricky to pick up. So I usually put a net down and try to scoop a few into the net with my hand instead of trying to grab them myself because they'll slide right out of, you, out of your hand. Now, a neat feature here I want people to notice is uh, the length. This is the anal fin on a prickleback. And you can see that it's either half the body length or more than half the body length. And that's important for telling a prickleback from another group of eel-like fishes we have here, which are common, that are called gunnels. And these are gunnels. These are, well, these aren't all of our gunnels. These are a few of our gunnels. And on a gunnel, the anal fin is less than half the length of the body. So that's an easy way to tell these two groups of fishes apart. And what's neat on this, you can see this gunnel, for example, that's its pelvic fin. The, the pelvic fins are reduced to these tiny little one or two fin rays. And they got little pectoral fins, the tails here. The dorsal fin runs most of the length of the body. And on this one, I'm not sure if you can see it in the pictures. It's, it's hard to photograph a fish <laughs> in an acrylic container and get it really crisp. So I do my best, but you can see the individual fin rays poking up along the top here. And those are all spiny rays. So we've got several species of gunnel in the province. Some of them are gorgeous. So the top two pictures here are crescent gunnels and they're named crescent gunnels because they've got these little sort of a spot with crescents either side of it. And you can see it even on this red one, the crescents in, in dark pigmentation are really obvious. The color of these guys can depend on what they're eating. So some crescent gunnels are orange, some of them are more red. The pen point gunnels, again, depending on their diet, they pick up different pigments. So this one's lime green. I don't think they taste like limes, but... Um, it looks like a banana. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, it, <laughs> this was a very young one, so it, it's, it's got tiny little fins and everything. But we have some of these gunnels that are, are bright red, some are orange, some are yellow, some are green. So when, you, when you're in a tide pool and you get what looks like a lime green banana, that, and they get up to about you know, I, I mean, I've caught them over, over 15 centimeters. I mean, it's amazing when you find one. It's like a dash of color in a bunch of uh, sort of gray, rocky environment. It's really neat to see them. But to be honest, it's perfect camouflage for where they live. Even a bright pink fish is perfectly camouflaged in the intertidal because we have pink coralline encrusting algae, And a pink fish will blend in beautifully to that. Um, these guys blend in with seaweed. We have red seaweeds, we have yellows and browns and bright green seaweed. So they are perfectly camouflaged, even though they look gaudy when they're on a picture like this. You said their color is dependent on what they're eating. Are they eating seaweed? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So they, they pick up the pigments from their diet, yeah. Um, another neat one we found, whoops, sorry. Whoa, too far ahead. Oh no, I blew it on that one. Um, this is a cling fish. This is another very common intertidal fish, and we found several of them yesterday. Um, the top picture, I, I was pointing with my finger and you guys can't see that, that's hilarious. Um, the top picture is a side view. So they're basically little flat, and if you look in belly view or top down, they're kind of comma shaped. They've got a big broad head and then a tadpole-like tail, really. And this whole area here, oops, geez, I shouldn't click. Uh, this area is basically a combination of pectoral fins, so basically the same structure as your arms, and the pelvic girdle, like your hips and your legs, 
And so it's pelvic fins and pelvic girdle here, which forms a suction cup. Now, when you find these guys in the intertidal, you can try to lift them off the rocks, but they won't budge. They are stuck down tight. The way to move them is to sort of gently push them a little bit. You don't want to push too hard because you will actually damage them before you'll pry them off the rock. And sometimes they get irritated and they let go and then you can catch them. Uh, sometimes if you're lucky, they just drop off the rock as you lift a rock and you can scoop them out from the gravel. But if they've got a large surface to, to stick to, they're really tough to move. Yesterday we caught a really, yeah, yesterday we caught a really big one. Um, trying to think of, I mean, I know you guys can't see my hand in this, 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 presentation we, but yeah folks it was, can see a little picture of you in the top corner so if you oh, hold up your okay. hand mm -hmm. it's it basically it was the length of my middle finger or larger it was quite a sizable uh sizable fish um it was really cool to see that we don't often get them that big every day um but yesterday i caught two that size or at least i found two i only put one in the tank but a big one when it sticks down to the side of the aquarium it was really difficult to get it to move. I had to just poke at it very gently to irritate it enough until it would let go and then I could catch it and then release it. Um, but once it was in that tank, it really wanted to stick in place. And these guys, they're stuck on a rock and waves can pound in and out and those fish don't get dislodged. There's another group of fish, actually there's two other, that are really common around here. Um, the spiny lump suckers. They're, That's my favorite. I know they're, I didn't have them in this presentation, but they're, they're basically, they have to be the cutest fish out here. Yeah, you have they're to look it up. <laughs> yeah, look that up. Pacific spiny lump sucker. They're basically, uh, a, a, if you could take a ping pong ball and make a fish out of it, that's what you'd have. They've got little prickles on the body and they hover around like little helicopters, but they have a modified pelvic girdle as well that forms a sucker that they can stick to seaweed and hold themselves in place so they don't get washed all over the place with the tide and the waves. You can find those guys at Willow's Beach. They're really adorable. Are they pretty territorial then, I guess, if they want to stay there? Or they just don't want to get swept out to sea? I think it's just to avoid being swept away. I don't think they're particularly territorial because I've seen them in captivity and they don't seem to badger each other at all. And the other group here that's in the intertidal that you can find with a suction cup as well are snailfish. And I do have a picture of a snailfish a little further on. This is another fish. This is one of the ones that looks like it's from the tropics. Mm. And I've only found three of these in, since I've been here in BC. And I found them further up the coast, way north of here. It's a kelp poacher. And it basically looks like a piece of seaweed. And they come in grays and oranges. This, the ones I caught were wine red. But they've got this little flange on the end of the nose. The eye is right there. The pectoral fin is here. And there's two dorsal fins, tail, and the anal fin. And these guys lie, the, the, the ones I caught were in really fine red algae and they were just wafting back and forth with the tide and the waves that are coming in and out of the tide pool. So they were almost invisible. And I caught them just by sort of raking my fingers through the seaweed. And sure enough, I got two in one hand. It was amazing. It was like, they're, they're the coolest fish out there, but certainly not something you would expect to see here in BC. Another one that I got way up the coast and I've only ever caught once. Uh, sadly, I don't think these were the ones I caught. I think Phil Lambert caught these ones back in 2005. Um, this is the rockhead and it looks like a chunk of sponge and it lies in the bottom of tide pools where there's gravel and rocks. And it basically looks, it's even got a little dent in the top of the head, like the opening in the top of a sponge. And they're, some of them are reddish, wine red, some of them are orange like this one. The ones I caught were sort of sandy brown, but they, they basically are mimicking sponges and they sit in the bottom of a tide pool. You can just reach in and pick them up. They sort of crawl along with their pectoral fins. They don't actually swim away really fast. So they're easy to catch, but they're not easy to see. So you really have to have your eyes peeled. Now, the other environments that I don't think people think about when they think about going to collect fish, are beaches. So you can have hard packed sand with rocks scattered all over the place. And yeah, the waves are coming in and out, the tides coming in and out, but these environments are also full of life. Mud flats where there's shelter, there's eelgrass growing, and there's a little shovel for scale here and some footprints from our intrepid 
natural history staff from back in 2005. Um, these mud flats, if you move that eelgrass away, you'll find fish right there exposed when the tide's out. Protected bays, all of these rocks would have fish in and around them. The uh, sea lettuce that's set down on the bottom here, it just settles as the tide drops out nice and gently. I think that's Kelly Sendel. At, at this point, he was a collection manager. Uh, this was the 2005 trip when we went way up the coast. I think we nicknamed it the Bugs Boys and Birds trip or something. It was it was a really fun couple of weeks on a boat, just us collecting. Um, even chunks of driftwood will have all kinds of things hiding underneath when the tide goes out. And then you can't can't forget things like the Fraser Delta, where you've got mud flats, um, little pools that'll hold fish. But again, although it looks kind of barren with some some vegetation here and there, it's crawling with life. And out on oh, the open beaches, oh, sorry. Just a, sorry, Gavin, I, I, maybe I could have waited to the end, but I was wanted to ask this question. Christian is wondering, how long are those rock heads, those little sponge-like fishes we saw, how big are those? About the length of your thumb. Okay, so not yeah. too big. Of they're an not adult big. thumb, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're really quite cool little fish. Um, they feel hard to the touch because they feel like a chunk of sponge. They're, they're really neat. I, I was amazed to catch them. And, you know, when you, when you get a fish like that, it really makes the days collecting and everyone just pours around to have a look at it because you don't see those every day. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Christian, for the question. Here's another fish that's super abundant. And these guys easily can get the, 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 to span a standard dinner plate. This is a sculpin that gets quite sizable. You can catch them on hook and line. It's a staghorn sculpin. If you do catch these, I recommend extreme caution. The, I was mentioning that sculpins have spines on their gills. Well, the staghorn sculpin has a three-pronged spine on the gill. And if you grab them and then they give a good shake, you will be bleeding. Uh, my friend uh, in Nanaimo calls these guys beach gators. It's not that they bite, but they will draw blood because their, their spines are razor sharp. And it's like the staghorn is like a, a deer's antlers, basically, is that's where they got the name for the for the species. They get large, but these guys are super abundant on beaches. Anywhere on our coast, you will find this species. Um, it doesn't matter if it's um, Haida Gwaii or the, the mainland, Vancouver Island, staghorns are everywhere. And even if you go down to Willows Beach and just do a walk in the shallows on a sunny day, you will see these guys racing off into the depths as you walk by. They're super abundant. The first one I ever caught actually swam between my foot and my sandals quite by accident. And I was able to base, lift my foot up, hop to shore, and then I had a fish in hand. It was really quite cool. It was a tiny one, so I didn't get poked by the, the, uh, the spines on its gills, but they're super abundant. Um, we do get flatfish in the shallows on sandy beaches and open mud flats. Uh, probably the easiest to identify is this one, the, the starry flounder, because it's got sort of a, a bristly feel to it. There are little platelets that are abrasive, but it's also got these sort of orangey to beige tinted and dark tinted fins. So they're, they're a really easy one to ID. But we've got a range of other flatfish like the butter sole, the English sole, things like that, the CO sole that you can find on our coast. And generally you don't see them until you disturb them and then they dart away. Uh, if you'd like to see soles, you can just go to Willows Beach or anywhere along Vancouver Island and just walk in the shallows. Eventually you're gonna scare off a flatfish. And uh, if, uh, you know, basically they'll dart off and then settle themselves back into the sand somewhere else to hide. So they're all about camouflage. This is beautiful camouflage in, in sandy, rocky environments. Another group of fish people forget about here um, are all related to seahorse. And this is a, uh, if you go, if you're in Victoria, you can go into the gorge and way up as far as the, uh, the gorge extends up from the harbor and you can find little pipefish in the shallows. I've been kayaking up there and I've seen hundreds of them when they've hatched, when the young ones have hatched out and left. The males, of course, like seahorses will carry their, their eggs until they hatch. Um, but they're basically uh, over the length of your hand. I've seen them at least 15 centimeters in length. They're, they range from gray brown to this nice little green one. 
they're super slow so you can easily grab them by hand you can even find them around our docks i've caught several right from the dock by hand another fish that's super common here along our coast is this three spine stickleback this, the third spine is here it's tiny but they've got these large spines and on the pelvic fin so if you grab these guys those spines will poke into you they're they're quite pointy um but all looks, of these fish have sorry it looks transparent they do well fish are like that fish mm. if the color is fish skin is transparent and there's layers of color which makes it when when i see fish taxidermy i always i, I shake my head because very few taxidermists get that depth to the the translucency of a fish's skin and the color depth um, stickleback show it beautifully and this one is not even in breeding dress they get blues and reds when they go into breeding another fish you find around docks and in, in quieter waters is the tube snout and again long slender snout i've seen hundreds of these under docks and when they go into breeding colors there's blues and oranges as well they're just beautiful we also have gobies here and their pelvic girdles formed not so much as a solid suction cup it's more like a little prop or a tripod so they can sit on the bottom um, I don't find a lot of these down here, but certainly further up the coast, uh, it's not difficult to find black eye gobies. They're not commonly in tide pools, they're just subtitle, so you do have to get a little bit wet if you want to try to find these guys. And the text here got cut off, but this fish here looks like a chunk of seaweed or kelp. It's a silver-sided sculpin, and these little spots on the body are actually reflective and silvery. You can get these in the eelgrass beds right off the sandy beach at Willows Beach here in Victoria. And you can get them all up the coast as well. But most people have no clue that this fish is here. It's, it's a pretty fish. They get quite large, like easily bigger than your hand. And yeah, it's just basically like a big leaf floating along in the water. And they sort of walk back and forth. Their pectoral fins flap a little bit. So you know, it's, it's not like a salmon that you'd see swimming by. These guys are, are cryptic. They, they rely on camouflage to hide from you. But if you pull a beach seine or if you're very quick with a dip net, you can easily get these guys to observe them. And then another fish that's in the shallows that is a greenling. You can actually catch green, young greenling in the shallows. And most people just think about greenling because you can catch them on hook and line. But the young ones are, are out there and it's not uncommon for us to catch those when we do a beach same. This is another of the fishes, the snailfish. I've seen them like this or even more brightly colored yellow. Uh, but this is another one with a suction cup made up of its pelvic girdle so it can stick to seaweed and kelp to avoid being washed away. But again, not uncommon here. It's whenever we go to a beach seine or a sample, I expect to find a, a couple of snailfish. We didn't yesterday. I don't think the tide was low enough. You'll find these lower in the inter intertidal, same with the greenling, but um, they're, they're everywhere and, and anyone can find them. The other thing about the intertidal is expect the unexpected. So this was a dogfish, a decent sized dogfish. We caught this guy, sorry, it's a female, this girl, in a, uh, in a crab trap that was set in less than a meter of water. So we were setting the trap to catch green crabs, which is an invasive species here. But we, we got, got up in the morning, went and checked our traps, and sure enough, a poor dogfish had got into one of them, and it did not survive. So I've saved that as a specimen. But we've also, uh, we've had ratfish in the intertidal. They, they come in at night, and some of them zig when they should have zagged, and they get trapped in a pool. And generally, the gulls or the eagles clean them up and finish them off. So the intertidal is not a forgiving place if you make a mistake. And so mm. sometimes these larger fishes find out the hard way. Um, probably the weirdest thing that's ever, in my opinion, showed up in the intertidal here on our, our portion of the Pacific coast uh, was a, a Pacific sleeper shark that showed up in a tide pool in Alaska. It was an, a juvenile, so obviously not, not full grown. They get several meters long. Um, but you know, you never know what you're going to find when you go out exploring and poking through tide pools. So yeah, I'll, I'll sort of end it there. Um, I think we're pretty much on time there and we can open it up for questions. Sure, Gavin will get you perfect to stop sharing. And did I, did it stop or no? Nope, you're still sharing. Uh, stop share, there we go. Perfect.
So our first question is from Leah. She said, in Tofino years ago, we saw a few sets of jaws under the sand. I think it was sandfish, but it's never seen one mm -hmm. since. Did you, have you seen that or do you think that's what it was? Yeah, sandfish are quite common here. People, people are lucky to see them. I get, every now and again, I get a specimen that washes up that, um, and then it gets sent to me as a, what is this? Because uh, they do seem so foreign and so unusual for our waters, but they're a native part of our, our fauna. They are, have you found them yourself on the beach or only things sent no. to you? Yeah. No, I've only so. had them sent to me. I've never collected them myself. Yeah, so quite lucky, Leah. Gavin, yeah. you mentioned uh, a few sort of guides. Can you recommend a particular handbook or a guide to identifying fish? Oh, I should have. You know, you're always a step ahead of me. Why didn't I think of that? Um, <laughs> there are, and Andy Lamb and Phil Edgel have put together a field guide to the fishes of the Pacific Northwest. It deals with things that are offshore as well as uh, intertidal. It's an excellent book. Um, just a second here. Um, let me see if I can quickly. So, fishes of the Pacific Northwest, that's something people would be yeah. able to find. Yeah, it's I'm trying to see if I could quickly find it on the, on the internet here. Um, anyway, yeah, Andy Lamb and Phil Edgel, it's a great book. It's the original version of it's hilarious because for many fish, they, they included potential recipes and their comments were hilarious, saying, like, who could possibly eat something this adorable? Um, <laughs> It, it's a great book. The original one is great, but the new one, the new version, um, the photography's improved and they include a lot of offshore fish as well. So really quite comprehensive. Um, if exactly. you really, sorry? Go ahead. If, if money isn't an object, um, Ted Peach and Jay Orr did a book called The Fishes of the Salish Sea. It's a three volume series, but I think it's at least 150 US. It's not a cheap book. Um, I'm thrilled to get my copy. Uh, it's got a place of pride on my shelves. I, I'm really happy to get that. So it's, it's a beautiful book. Jacqueline says that um, Fishes of the Pacific Northwest is available at a place like Monroe's. You can find it there. Oh, yeah, you can find it in any bookstore, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Anna um, said so she's interested in, in getting to know more about fish. She's interested in them already. Um, how do you, Gavin, recommend starting to go out and look for them? The easiest thing to do is, um, I mean, it's like, it's like bird watching. You don't have to go far to start seeing fish. Any beach, any tide pool, I, it doesn't matter, Willows Beach, if you're in, I, I'm, I'm assuming Victoria here, which is probably an incorrect assumption it could be on you could be on the mainland this is virtual um you can walk along docks and you will see stickleback you'll see herring uh, small salmon small rockfish um surf perch pipefish you and, and tube snuts i mean there's there's even on a dock where you think it was industrial and really busy and dirty there's still lots of fish to see is um, there a time of year or a time of the day that's better no no, uh, I mean, I'm a fair weather, I admit it. I prefer going out in nice weather. I've been out when it's really lousy and rainy and cold. Uh, I've been out at five in the morning collecting when that's when the low tide is, so that's when you go out. Uh, late night, November, rainy, cold. We used to do those beach scenes. I remember the numb fingers. You'll still find fish out there. Even on Willow's Beach, a flat expanse of sand, you find one rock there, and if you lift it up, it's not... Uh, surprised to find one or two fish right there. Um, I think my first rose lip sculpin, uh, which is our only sculpin species without pelvic fins, so it's easy to identify, our first rose lip sculpin, or at least my first one ever, back in 1991, it's ridiculous that I can remember that, um, it was under a rock on Willows Beach and I was out at nine at night when the tide was out. I had a headlamp so that I could see what I was finding and flipped a rock, boom, there it was. So. That fish is now at the University of Manitoba in their pickle collection, so. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for the questions, everyone, and thank you uh, for sharing those tips, flipping over, flipping over some rocks, getting a, getting a guidebook, great ways to get started. So, uh, yeah, the, folks. Can I say one more thing? Yeah. Quickly, if, if you are out collecting in the intertidal, remember that pretty much every step in the intertidal zone 
uh, you might be stepping on something alive. So tread as lightly as you can, try to avoid crushing barnacles. I know it's pretty much impossible. I wear some softer sandals and everyone laughs because I live in my, my sandals, but um, okay. I, I try to avoid rock. And if, if a rock is really movable, don't step on it because thing, if you shift the rock, you're probably going to crush something. Um, and if you do lift rocks to look under them, put them back as gently as you absolutely can so that uh, we do as minimal impact as possible. Oh, that's really great. Gavin, I, mean, I, I should ask, are there any rules or limitations about collecting? Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you want to collect, you, you should officially get a, a, a permit for intertidal fishes from Fisheries and Oceans Canada. We get one every year for the museum. And there's usually restrictions on what you can and can't keep. I think it's a limit of up to 50 of any species, but our permit for the museum does not include halibut, lingcod, rockfish, things that people would like to go fishing for, anything that's a food item. Uh, but the standard non-game fish, we can take up to 50 of each. Although if I showed up with 50 great white sharks, I think I'd be in trouble. No, we don't do that. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, members and locals may be aware that the Royal BC Museum is getting ready to reopen uh, next Friday, June the 19th. As a staff member, I'm thankful for the teams that have been working hard to ensure the safest conditions for staff, volunteers, partners, and visitors to return. And you can find out more on our website. We will be continuing our at-home, at-home kids, and at outside for the foreseeable future, and links for those programs are also posted on the website. I'm going to be back on Saturday with a special presentation at 1 p.m. with Parks Canada, and we'll be talking about southern resident killer whales. So hope, hopefully we'll join us back. Hopefully we'll get on Facebook. And <laughs> thank you all for including us in some of your screen time. And keep taking care of yourselves and one another.